today we're going to go over industrial electronic components or electrical components including electronic stuff and it's really a broad base to cover so I'm going to go through it kind of more a rapid pace than anyone can actually understand this stuff but at least you'll have some place to go if you want to get a quick head start you know some place to leap off and learn whatever it is you need to know for whatever problems come up and also it's an opportunity to just cover you know very wide breadth of material and give you a chance to ask questions if there's something that really relates to what you do. I know some of this already is going to be applicable and so I'll highlight that stuff. But if anything else comes up that you guys are like, we want that more of that, I can cover it now or we can get to it like in the next class. All right, so starting from the bottom, uh, ground is, think of it as zero volts and it's literally, well, if you see one of these symbols, these are different types of ground, but they're all going to be the same equipotential, the same voltage of zero. It's the same risk of electric shock as if you went outside and touched the ground, which would be no, no chance of it. The green wires, or insulation, green insulation or green and yellow insulation are indicating ground. And as you might imagine from what I've said, this is a safety feature. Proper grounding means getting things to that there's zero potential, zero chance of a shock. Um, yeah, and then that's it. Just to make a note of it also that grounding is simple in a way. You know, I mean, you see it's a spike in the ground, but there's, because there's a safety aspect to it, there is something involved in the engineering of it. So don't just assume that you can hook things up to ground and everything will be safe because you can have, just because of the nature of the world we're in, you can have something tied to ground that's still creating a potential between it and the ground outside. Uh, so what it comes down to is really grounding in one place and then having everything else have a direct path to that. Um, and it's more complicated than we need to get into now, but ground loops are a possibility. So things that should be grounded are the enclosure, which is a box that holds our, all your electrical stuff. A sub panel fits inside the enclosure. Um, that's Everything else is mounted onto the sub panel, typically on a DIN rail or mounted directly onto the sub panel. And DIN is an acronym for like a university in Germany, I think, but what it means is those dimensions. And it's just a standard way of clipping things on. Normally there will be like a release on the bottom if you need to take anything off of a DIN rail. And if you're mounting anything new into an electrical system, it's a good idea to just use a DIN rail just for easy access and easy um, popping in and popping out. We went over this in, because we did some hands-on, so this shouldn't be anything new. But just as a reminder, you've got uh, the part that's actually conducting electricity and the part that should not be conducting electricity. That's the conductor and the insulator. Wire gauge is how wide or the diameter of that conductor. Smaller gauge means wider, uh, wider conductors. And if you have a group of conductors together, bound together, that's what a cable is. So here are the conductors with their own insulation and then you've got a outer insulation that's called the jacket. That's what's grouping everything together. Shielding is optional, and that's mostly for interference because you have you know radio waves and you have uh, crosstalk between different cables potentially. So that's something to pay attention to if you're looking at buying cables, if you're or if you're going to a, into a system and you know what cables are going to be in there. Shielding is a pain in the butt unless it's necessary, and then you know you just have to deal with it. When you're picking out cables, those, that's really the important thing to pay attention to. Shielding, as I just mentioned, what the gauge is, and then how many conductors are in there. If you have that, you're pretty much going to get the cable you need. Is that the gauge of each individual wire, the 18 gauge? It is, yes. And as you might imagine, you can have a, wire or a cable with multiple gauges in it. Say, for instance, you want to run a big motor with it, and you also want to tell the motor when to turn on and off. You know, like the motor has its own controller. So you have a couple small wires for the signal portion, yeah, control, and then you've got big wires, big diameters. Exactly right, yeah. But typically it's gonna be, you know, um, the easiest thing would be all the same, of course. 
connectors, there are a lot of different connectors out there, but they all have some aspect to it. There's a, the male side, which is, you can see like that fits inside that, the, the whole thing, so that would be the male, but the pins, the metal contacts are actually what goes in there, so this is the male side of the connector, pin contacts, and if you see plug, that's, um, the plug would be the male side also, so actually that's a male plug. That was a bit confusing, but plug refers to male, and this is like the male connector, but these pins are male. So just understand it, because that can trip you up if you're trying to pick out a connector. It's good to get a picture and understand exactly what they're talking about with where the plug is, where the pins are. This is some stuff, and actually when I mentioned earlier about things you might have questions about, I just blasted out a number of things that you might see inside an enclosure, just so you have a name to associate with these things, and so it's not a surprise when you see them. Like this, uh, cable glands, are to, or they're also called, yeah, strain relief, is to hold onto the jacket so that you're not moving around any of the conductors inside of the jacket on a cable. And it looks complicated, but really that's all it's doing. It's just a grip. They're also called cable grips. A lot of this is wire management, meaning keeping the wires in one place so they're not just this spaghetti mess inside the enclosure. All right, this is a picture of the hands-on that we did during class two, and that's the power supply. It's also called the power adapter because what this one is doing is taking power from the grid um, out of the wall and then turning it into a different kind of power. Specifically, it's getting 110 volts AC in from the wall, which is our standard line and then putting out 24 volts, which is what that motor needed. A battery is also a power supply. And I mentioned already, so DC has no phase because it's all one steady voltage level. Uh, phase, we'll get into it a little later, but it's, it requires something to be changing, like alternating current. And those two things are specified and also the current possible. You're not, if it's rated for two amps, five amps. If it's rated for five amps, it doesn't mean it's gonna be pushing five amps. Think back to the equation we saw, class one, V equals IR, it's gonna put out whatever current the circuit is pulling, essentially, or the circuit demands. The amperage maybe is a max, right? So it's a max, exactly right, yeah. Switches, we've, had our hands on, I think we understand them well, but it's gonna be a good setup for the next things because really a lot of this stuff, a lot of the things you see out there in the electrical box or any sort of complicated electronic system boils down to a configuration of different switches. So good thing to have in mind throughout. Normally open because if the switch is by itself, you know, passive, untouched, it's open, it's an open circuit and Bear in mind that there's a button on top of this, but the button isn't the switch. The switch is just the part that connects. In fact, to highlight that point, you can have a single button that's opening one switch and closing another switch when the button is actuated. Limit switch is an example of a switch, and that can also be a sensor. You know, stick that on a wall, and when a door closes, it bumps it, and now you have a door closing sensor. But it's really just a switch. This is like a normally closed switch, a fuse or a circuit breaker, two different devices that essentially act as switches that are closed and then in a certain condition the switch will open up. It's, or you could say it's a sensor for overcurrent conditions and that's a, a safety thing. So you, different types, sacrificial means that this thing is gonna burn out and needs to be replaced in an overcurrent condition. These will just create this giant resistance if there's a lot of current and then when, the, when things, I think it's actually heat sensitive. So a lot of current creates a lot of heat and that makes it highly resistive. When things cool off, it'll allow current to flow again. Circuit breaker, same idea as sacrificial basically, except for you can flip it back into position and close that switch. A solenoid, um, I think this is the first time we're seeing it, so I'll go into a bit of detail on it. 
when there is, it's also called a coil. So if you hear coil for the rest of this class, I'm talking about solenoids. If you run current through this arrangement of wire, it creates a magnetic field. If there's a magnet inside that field, it's going to respond accordingly, just like two like magnets coming together. They're going to push away from each other, vice versa with the different magnets. So you can typically, on solenoids, you'll see there's a spring return. Push the magnet in one direction, release the current, and the spring will bring it back to its original position. And we're getting into relays now. So this is the coil part of a relay. And here's a diagram of how a relay works. Conceptually, what we're doing with a relay in, I'll call it these two circuits, is closing a switch on one side of the relay, and that causes a switch to close in a separate circuit. So now these two circuits are connected by way of a relay. K1 is a circuit mark that identifies a circuit element, a thing in electric circuit, and that thing is a relay. So here's K1, that's the relay, and here's K1, that's the relay. Two parts of a relay. One of them is the coil, that solenoid I just showed, and the other is a switch. So when the coil, when the coil is energized, that creates a magnetic field, and that closes the switch. Yes? A useful reason for doing that is because, as you see, we have that coil being energized with one volt DC. There's no way that push button is going to close a circuit between that and the lamp and have the lamp do anything, because the lamp requires 100 volts AC. But because you have this relay that's connecting the circuits, um, Logically, you've got a, that button and this power source controlling that lamp. Here's what's going on inside a relay to kind of make that more concrete. There's the coil, and that creates the magnetic field. In this case, there's not a magnet flowing through it, but there is the um, what's called the common contact, or the common terminal here connecting to the common contact. That's what's pulled by the magnet, and as you can see, that normally open switch gets closed when the coil noise when the coil is energized. See the word contactor, that's a relay that has some physical properties that make it well suited for managing large currents. You know, because there's going to be like a little bit of bounce, for instance, when that thing comes down, it has to settle in. You don't want that to be happening or you're going to have electric arcs if there's a huge current situation. Another use of the same concept, so you've got a, instead of circuit B being that 100 volts AC, like we saw a couple ago, you could have the circuit B being a fluid circuit. So this is a solenoid valve. Here, that symbol is a solenoid. If you see a valve, I won't go through the whole diagram, but you guys are probably seeing these. The solenoid fires, and that moves it from this condition, or this state, to this state. And that means that the high pressure line is going to go for, to one side or the other side of your actuator, your cylinder. And this, if you see transducer, that's you probably encountered that already, that's converting from one type of energy to another. In this case, it's from electrical to fluid power. Um, this came up when we were talking about cables. So you've got like the power side and the signal side, or the control side and something the relay was doing was isolating those two things. We had our low power with a person pushing a button, and then we had a high power side, which is what that relay was controlling on the switch side. Isolation does a number of useful things. Um, separating those two things means that one circuit is not going to influence the other. Like if you've got this giant magnet flying around in a motor, you don't want that to affect these you know, high clock speed control signals like internet traffic or something like that. So isolated circuits. Safety is another thing, yeah. So getting into electronics, we'll look at some transistor symbols in a little bit, but just for awareness now, that's a phototransistor. You've got light rays coming in, and that means that that closes like a switch, as I was saying before. This is essentially a switch closing. 
and it's closing when that light is passed through. So now instead of creating a magnetic field to tie together two circuits logically, you're using light rays to tie them together logically. And you'll see that inside you know, PLCs and sensors and things, but that's, that's what's happening. It's, it's kind of isolation like we just saw. The full transistor, they can't handle high current. I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to look that one up. I've, that might be a reason for keeping relays around, say as PLC outputs, but I'd be willing to bet there are transistors specifically made for handling, you know, whatever, you, 10 amps or whatever you're talking about. A photocoupler is what this circuit actually is, or opto-isolator. Um, another interesting thing you can do with transistors is shown here. It's called a flip-flop or latch, and this is where I had that. Well, thought I had it pulled up earlier, but here we go. Okay, so this circuit is live. You've got, we'll call it 24 volts. You got your high volt up there and your zero down here, which means current is passing through, uh, as you see that way, I think. Okay, so now the circuit is live. You can see there's high voltage up there, zero down there, and you see the arrows moving. I think they're in yellow. You can probably see them moving through that transistor. Here's a switch that we can press. And if you press the switch, it's now moved over there to that side. So now that, that transistor is active and this one is doing nothing. All the current's flowing through the right side of the circuit. Um, I think this one, yeah. So if we keep pressing that first button, it doesn't change anything. It continues over there. If we push the second button, then it returns to its original state where this is on and that's off. And what's interesting about this circuit is that it's remembering the last button that you pushed. In this case, the last button we pushed is over here. We can keep pushing it and it will keep remembering that that was the last button we pushed. We pushed this, now we can look at the circuit. You can even come to the circuit after someone else has been there and see that that button was pushed. It's remembering one thing. One thing happened, either A, this happened, or B, that happened. Or in other words, true or false, zero or one, this is one bit of memory. And it's kind of giving you a peek into why transistors have become such a big deal and why they're all over the place in computers. One bit of memory. And transistors, essentially in, in electronics, they replaced vacuum tubes. This is, those are one byte modules, I think. Um, like, you can see that's eight bits, and that's probably even just for pushing the bits through, and this is something more like one byte of memory. So. Eight, eight bits as we just saw with that circuit set up, this would be accomplishing the same thing. It's why there were rooms that filled up, or sorry, computers that filled up entire rooms, you know, with like 10,000 bits. And now we have tens of millions of bytes for five bucks, you know. Same thing with uh, processors, actually even more so with processors as far as miniaturization and getting a lot of computing power in a small space for very cheap. It's all thanks to transistors. Transistors, uh, we're not going to go, I, I should say that this is getting into areas where I have some knowledge of, but it's like it's never paid me off to understand any of this stuff, and I, I don't fully understand how, how this stuff is even accomplished other than transistors being at the core kind of um, simple construction. You know, it's like a complicated wire made out of uh, material with specific properties. And actually this is pretty much that. So you've got different types of semiconductor material or different doping as it's called. Uh, you put down silicon, treat these two parts of the silicon differently and it does something interesting. Which in this case only allows current to pass through one way easily. An LED light emitting diode is an example of those diodes and when current passes through in that direction it's also throwing out photons.
that's a PN arrangement. And if you put another P on this side, that's a PNP, and that's where those numbers come from. That PN is positive and negative. Um, PNP and PN are different. As they're what they sound like. Put an N on this side, that's NPN. And that's as far as we're going to get into the physics, because like I said, that's about as far as I understand it. But it means that you treat these transistors differently in a circuit because they're going to behave differently. Uh, if you hear solid state, that just means that there are no moving parts, no liquids, no gases. So a solid state hard drive, the thing's not spinning. Solid state transistor means you don't have that contact closing like we saw earlier. It's just um, semiconductor material. Semiconductor meaning something between conductor and insulator. It varies between those things. I'll put this on here. I've, we're also going to have an attachment to this class in the training materials so you can see where this came from. But I refer to this fairly often for if I look at a PNP circuit, you know, this is just a great refresher. Or if someone says this is a sinking input, and you think, what's that? Just handy chart to check out. And I'll leave this here. I'm not going to say much about it now because the important part of this we're going to go into with sensors. You've probably seen uh, sensors having PNP or NPN output, and it's the exact same material, but we'll specifically address that in a moment when we, when we get to sensors. And now on to motors. This is the stuff that I think is important to have in your head when you're thinking about motors. There is the part that's moving and there is the part that's not moving. Rotor is moving. The shaft is on the rotor. That's actually spinning around. Stator is staying put. And that's the part with the mount. Inside the stator and or the rotor are coils, just like we saw before, or I'm sorry, windings. Windings, but they're really doing what coils are doing. They're running electricity through them to create magnetic fields. And it's the same principle as solenoids or the relay, where you are creating a magnetic field and making something move. In this case, it's moving in a circle. So to get into that a bit more, just to, on the basic level, what's happening with when you have current moving through a wire is you're creating this ring of energy that would force things to move in a circle around it if they're magnetic. It's a magnetic field. Doing the same thing but tracking through this, you know, you're just taking the wire and moving that same behavior into a circle and that causes the fields to accumulate in one area and have a stronger magnetic field there. Repeat that coil multiple times and that's where the solenoid comes from. For me, that's about the part that's comprehensible. And then when you look at what's happening inside a motor with these different coils being energized at different levels throughout time, you know, as time moves forward, the coils are energized differently and the fact that things are moving in relation to them changes their fields and changes the current and the resistance. And it looks like this if you do a Google search on what the resistance is inside a motor. You know, there's all these different things going on. And to me, that's not useful. And I think it's never, it's never come up in my career. And I don't think it's something we really need to understand, maybe other than knowing that there is a lot of complexity. So if something's going wrong, you know, that's kind of the area you'd be heading into. It's also the reason we have motor drives. Motor drives take all that complexity and provide an interface to the user or programmer engineers like us to tell the motor what we want it to do, you know, read the manual for a day or two, tell the motor what you want it to do, and all the electrical stuff is handled by the drive. So well I'll go through that. So there's speed control, say you want it to move at a certain speed. Torque control often like a torque limit. You don't want it to move more than this torque or you want to ensure that it's always maintaining this torque no matter what. Uh, power adapters are the same thing as the power supply we saw earlier. You're provide, getting outside power and providing the power that the motor needs. Position control, uh, we'll get into more of that in a moment, but it's what it sounds like. Brakes are often used on motors which just halts the motor in its position. Uh, circuit protection, fail safes like the stuff we saw earlier with 
fuses and so on. And these do get, there's a really simple one there that's basically just changing the direction of the motor and handling some of that, um, smoothing out the power, you would say. So instead of a signal that's like that, it's a steady 24 volts, whatever you need. And I'd say for the rapid grab, that takeout system that we built here, the motor drive actually had the PLC built into it. So that's kind of the level of complexity these things get to. If you're controlling motors, there is frequency modulation is something good to have in mind. So first of all, frequency. We've got this wave here, a sine wave, and the distance it's moving through time here. So as time passes, the voltage level is going up and down. That's alternating current like we saw in the first class. All right, so frequency, sine wave, it's moving up and down in voltage as time passes. And the amount of time that takes place between a peak and another peak, that's the wavelength. The shorter that wavelength gets, like you can see it going from a long wavelength to a short wavelength, that's an increase in frequency. And you think about how many times it reaches that peak, how frequent the reaching of that peak is. Um, yeah, frequency one over wavelength, the inverse of wavelength. The unit is hertz, which is something per second or cycles per second, just like I was saying, how many times that peak is reached per second. And RPM is correlated to this, the speed of the motor. This is AC motors, of course. We're talking about alternating waves. The speed is cor correlated to the frequency, but not the same as the frequency, because what you're doing is energizing those windings in the motor at this frequency. Uh, pulse width modulation is another type of wave that's used in a different type of motor. And we'll see that in a second, but well, I'll explain what it is here because we're about to look at three different types of motors. You've got your zero voltage, and the, here it says five voltage, but it's whatever voltage the motor requires in order to have its um, designed torque. Say it's five volt motor. You go between zero volts and five volts back to zero in that sort of square wave looking pattern. And the width of this high side, the amount of time that it's on, called the duty cycle, is how fast it's going to move. So here you see some different duty cycles. Zero, motor is not moving at all. 100%, it's almost like it was on the whole time. In fact, it might not even bounce down because you can make that so fast. But that's 100% duty cycle. If you hear brush or commutator, that's talking about a DC motor, and it's how the motor is sending energy to its different windings. Because imagine motors as having some magnets moving around, and those magnets moving around cause other magnets to move around. So the first magnets that are moving are controlled by commutators in a DC motor. Alternatively, you can just have an electronic circuit programmed to control those windings, and that's a brushless motor. That's what's taking place in a brushless motor. On the other hand, you can send a signal like this, a wave, and that wave goes to the uh, windings and makes the field change that way. So here it's positive and here it's negative. You can think of that as magnets flipping around like this, and if you do that, in the right arrangement that's going to keep the motor spinning. I say keep the motor spinning because if it's just one wave, it's probably going to be, it, I don't know if it is necessarily or it could be in a position where it's not going to move. In that case, you would need a, I think I wrote it, yeah, start capacitor to get things rolling. If it's three phase, that's not an issue. And to understand what three phase is, I think can be tricky because the first time I saw it and pretty much any time you see a three phase diagram, they're all stacked on top of each other, and I didn't really have a sense of where these things were taking place. I thought it was all in the motor and kind of left it at that. But the way I like to think about this is that you've got three equipotentials, or three wires, going into the motor, and those things are separate from each other. Each one controls a different group of windings. So you've got your one windings, your two windings, and your three windings. Just whatever, different configurations. And now, 
you're going to energize those at different times. And when you say different times for energizing those, that's why you'll see these things peak for each of those groupings at different times. And that's the phase shift. That's why it's called three phase. There are different phases, meaning they're taking place at different time. So phases as you move along the time axis here. And that creates that revolving magnetic field around. Synchronous and asynchronous are terms that come up here, and that's just whether the motor, whether the rotor is moving perfectly the same rate as your magnetic field, or along with your magnetic field, or if it's chasing after it, essentially, sort of like running after it and pushing and running after and catching up and pushing again. Stepper motor is one that you might see. I, this, these used to be much more common in industrial use. We've moved on more to servos now, but you'll still see them, and it's good to know kind of what's happening here is that there's position control by having a more refined or a higher resolution of positions that it can move. Like, say here we had these three different groups. Here we're seeing a diagram with 16 different positions. And that's done by four different windings. When this one's on, and this is off. This is the same thing we saw earlier, I should say, where there's a high voltage and a zero voltage. So energized, there's a magnetic field. Not energized, no field. This one's on, that's off, that's on, that's off. And that means that the motor is going to be in this position. It means that you're trying to put the motor in that position. There's no feedback, so you don't actually know if it's in that position. But that's what's happening here. So you move through these different positions, say, I want you here, I want you here, I want you here. Those, each of those clicks is called a step, which is where it gets its name, stepper motor. And that's how you complete cycles and position, is by sending energy to those different windings. So as I just mentioned for the stepper motor, that's an open feedback system. You're sending a command. I want the stepper motor in this position, and then there's no way you know if it actually landed there or not. On the contrary, the closed loop feedback is actually giving you some information about what's happening on the system. And that allows you to adjust things before you send your input back into the system. And process is just you know the thing that's happening. Output is what's happening on the other end. What you want to happen, what's happening, and what happened, I guess. Um, that's what closed loop is. And as this applies to motors, it's where servo motors come in. Here's physically what it looks like. You can tell there's you know, two things happening here. One of them is controlling the motor, and the other cable is something back here. And that's the feedback. That's where you get your feedback. Different ways of getting feedback. An encoder is probably what you're going to typically see. It might be, in, I should say, it might be included in the motor housing also. You're not always going to see two cables, but this is um, conceptually useful. The encoder tracks how fast the spinning is occurring. You know, it's like, it doesn't, well, okay, it's shining a light. Here you're seeing it shine a light through this rotating disk with holes in it, and there's a receiver on the other end, kind of like that. Um, optical coupler we saw earlier, and so it knows when that disk is passing through the holes. But however it's done, it's not always done like this. It's giving you some information about what the motor is actually doing. Another way of doing it, this is a variable resistor, a potentiometer, like we saw in class one. And as the motor is, actually it's not as the motor is turning, it's as this thing, the actuator, the part you care about. As this is turning, then the potentiometer follows, and then you can get a reading off the potentiometer and you know where you are. That's where that's what makes the, something a servo motor, a uh, servo like um, slave motor. I think is where the term comes from. It's your control is slaved to the output, depends on the output for that feedback. A linear actuator is nothing more than a motor that's converted to linear movement. You can do that with ball screws or uh, lead screws. Um, and probably some other ways of doing that too, but this is the only thing I've seen or worked with. And if you want to make this a servo mechanism, just to tie things together from earlier, having a sensor that tells you how far that's extended is, would be a good way to build the servo mechanism. Or if you're trying to move something with that, then you could measure the thing you're trying to move. 
So that's just to explain that a servo mechanism doesn't need to be all housed together or even all off the shelf. It can be a custom solution. You're still building a servo mechanism if you're drawing feedback from the environment. Into communication. The main thing to take from this, these two pictures, is that analog and digital are different uses of electronics or of electric circuits. Uh, it's, I think it can be kind of confusing and easy to conflate the two because they're all using electrons and they're all using circuits, but really they're totally different domains. You know, if you're controlling a motor and you just want to pump energy into it and make that big magnet and cause something to move, that's a totally different way to use circuits than if you're you know, sending bits over the internet. And that's kind of what it comes down to is bits and bytes versus power. If you're, this is a picture from an oscilloscope, which is just a way of showing these things that we've been talking about, you know, the signals moving up and down. This will actually show you those things that are happening in a circuit. Uh, so this is low and high, low and high there. And you'll see this one looks like it's doing something kind of interesting. You know, there's a long pulse and there's a shorter pulse. And this one looks very regular. And that very regular signal is a clock. And if you hear like a processor is a 4 gigahertz clock, that means that it's going up and down. I don't know if I remember what a gigahertz is. I think it's like a billion. So 4 billion times per second, this thing is going up and down. And why that's useful is the rest of your circuitry is depending on that clock, is often depending on that clock so that it's synchronized. In fact, something with a clock is often called synchronous. And asynchronous communication doesn't use a clock. But when this thing, say, it rises up, you have another part of your system that's saying, is this blue signal high or low? And that's just to give you an idea of why, why having regular square shapes like that is useful. On the other hand, something like this, if you're you know, powering a motor like those curves we saw earlier, or if you're watching a button get pushed, it'll have this you know, bounce signal, piezoelectric devices, totally different world. Uh, for communication, so here's an example. You've got 0 and 1. Actually, that's what we see on the clock. You can call that 0 and 1, low, high. That's not a clock. I take it back. If you had a clock pulse here, 0 and 1, then you've also got another line that's sh saying, now the, now the data is 0, now the data is 1, now the data is 1, and so on. So that clock is telling you when to read the data, and then your other line is going low or high to actually feed the data there. So you've got a circuit on this side, receiver side, Sorry, receiver side's over here. Um, and that is paying attention to that, say, the blue line. If it reads 1 and then 0 and records that, now you've transmitted data. That's the essence of communication. If you have multiple lines doing this at the same time, that's parallel. Parallel lines. A number of standards and protocols. So a standard could be something like how many volts or how much resistance should be in the line. How often do you need to relay that to get the voltage levels back up to where they belong? That can be a standard, and then protocol typically refers to just things like when you see that 111001 or whatever come through the line, what does that actually mean? Or, yeah, what does that actually mean? What do you do with the first four bits? What do you do with the second four bits? All that stuff is a protocol, and it's like, the English language we're using now, where these sounds traveling through the air actually mean something. You know, it's just establishing a protocol for what those ones and zeros mean. All right, so this is where I said I was going to get back into PNP. Oh, I should say first, sensors. We're in that digital side of the two domains of electrical power. This is certainly the communication or signal side of things. And you can have sensors in both digital and analog. So that's to highlight that just because something's not power doesn't mean it's digital. There are still analog signal things. So like an analog signal would be if you had a distant sensor and your voltage increased the closer you got to the object that it was detecting. 
a lot of stuff, I'd say the vast majority of sensors that we use in industrial automation are digital, and part of that is just for certainty, reliability. If you're depending on something to be 4.82 volts and it's slightly off, you know, because someone didn't plug it in all the way or because there's a giant motor right next to it that's actually creating a magnetic field and pushing more electrons. Um, we work in messy environments. It's easier to just say, is it 12 volts or is it zero? In fact, you'll often see it's, this is a 24 volt sensor and if you give it 10, it's fine. If you give it 50, it's fine. You know, that's, that's kind of a nice thing area to work in. A lot of these require power. Um, so there's a circuit inside this sensor and that circuit needs to be energized in order to function correctly. We'll go through this so you kind of see what's happening here. This is NPN, which refers to what type of transistor is in there. And it's not, that's about just beyond the limit of where things are useful for me. Like if it says NPN, you'll almost always get a diagram like this or you can look what up and see what that means for you, which is how to connect it. That's your power supply. That's ground we saw earlier. So power supply, we'll say it's 24 volts at the top, zero volts down here. When this thing detects, this transistor is activated. And I probably didn't go into that enough earlier, but because we're using transistors like a switch, it just means that you're gonna allow current to pass right through as if it's a solid wire. The sensor detects something. That means the 24 volts up there can see zero volts down here or here. And that means that the voltage is going to pass through that. You know, now you have a voltage drop across your load. And load does not mean like you're running a motor or even powering a light or anything. All it means is load is the thing that's watching sensor output. Conceptually, that's what it is. And so if say that's a PLC input. You know, you want to know if that sensor is detected, so you tie it to one of your PLC inputs. Now the PLC feels a, a voltage drop because it's th flowing current through that load, and the, the so you know the sensor has detected something. And it's gonna be just the opposite on PNP. Now, the l black is your output. That was the black wire. So now, when the transistor closes, it's going to become 24 volts, this. And that means that if this is, since this is zero, 24 volts is a voltage drop across the load and you're getting the same result. You know, when the sensor is active, you get the voltage drop. As I said before, all that PNP NPN means for you is where you connect this load. Here, Active sensor means that your output is going to be zero. Here, active sensor means that your output is going to be 24 volts. And that's really it. So that's, those are the more complicated sensors that we might see. There's other stuff, like a relay, you could say is a sensor, and this is kind of doing the same thing a relay does, where if a magnet gets close to it, that metal wire closes down and now you have electricity passing through. Some place you might see reed switches are on pneumatic cylinders. When it's fully extended, there's a magnet inside the cylinder, you know, near the, whatever that part's called. Anyone? The disc inside? Piston. Is that a piston? Yeah, okay. Uh, but that plate, the piston that moves up and down has a magnet on it, and when it gets to the, the reed sensor, the magnet will close the sensor, and now you know you're in your fully extended position. I considered going into more detail about all the different types of sensors, but there are really a lot out there. And as you can see from what we were doing breaking down this sensor, it's stuff you've seen before. You know, the diode we didn't even mention, but it just means there's something going in there to power the circuit. And the circuit's not pushing out any power because that's a one-way valve. But other than that, everything you've seen in there, you can kind of break it down. And especially when you see this diagram, which is typically all you need to look at, you'll understand that this voltage drop is what you care about. So wire that up and your sensor is good to go. This is something that's kind of of historical interest, I'd say more than anything, because 
almost all these functions have been brought into PLCs. And most of the time, for any of the systems I've encountered, we just have the PLC do it. There are some exceptional cases, like if you want to get totally accurate counting of you know, how many screws are passing through a, an air tube, you might want to hook up a sensor and just have it do nothing but count. And then when it reaches that 200 screws or whatever you're looking for, send a yes signal to your PLC. Maybe that's some way we'll, where you will see this, but most of the time, a PLC is just going to do all of it. It is interesting to look at this also because a relay, this is a uh, solid state, so this is like basically a transistor, but relays, um, transistors, and counters, and timers are all things that you'll see in PLC code. So that's part of why they're there at all. Instead of coming up with some new logical system and putting that into ladder logic, it, they just took things that were already out in the field and said, here's a software version of that same thing. Timers do what you might imagine. Actually, we have a diagram here, so this is worth explaining. Power is just this thing being on or off. So the important thing to look at here is start signal, that second row. When the start signal goes, a time later, your normally open channel is going to go high. So that's a normally open, normally closed. So they start out like this. You know, when this thing's just unpowered, sitting on a shelf somewhere, this is how the switches are, high and low. After you send the start signal, it reverses. So that's what a timer is, is just waiting a while and doing something else. And it used to be that people would take relays, build up all this logic, like if this relay is closed and this relay is closed, then start the timer. After the timer completes, close this other relay. They would just build that with devices like this. Nowadays, it's all brought into the PLC ladder logic, achieving the same thing. That's everything. Any questions?